Nice. Um, now, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm uh, speaking to you tonight from Gunbainga country at Coffs Harbour, uh, very wet Coffs Harbour, six inches of rain overnight. Um, but just in acknowledging the traditional owners, I think it's really important as transport planners that we think about how many of our roads and railways follow paths that were uh, originally opened up by the, the traditional owners of the land. And it's, I often find it a, a sobering thought to think of, you know, we're actually occupying those, those spaces and moving through those spaces in, in, in comparable ways to what people did for, for thousands of years. And I think that the, the land that we work on is, was never ceded. But what I want to do tonight is to talk about um, betters as a way of um, dealing with the climate emergency and uh, the um, growing social inequality rate rises yesterday um, and the um, cost of living pressures in the suburbs are, are, are growing and that really is a major part of that. We, we haven't really tackled the growing uh, emissions from transport, and we certainly haven't found ways for, for people to, to move around the suburbs with, without using a car, and that, that's adding to, to people's cost of living pressures. This work, what I'm talking about tonight, is based on two papers that um, we will be releasing the week of next through the Melbourne Centre for Cities. And I've written these in conjunction with Ian Laurie, who is working with us after having uh, worked in the, the Department of Transport. He's doing a very interesting PhD at the moment on um, the ways we might be looking at using new technologies. In, uh, but, but he has a, a lot of experience in, um, in transport planning. And he and I and, and others have worked together on two complementary papers. The first one is looking at the, the zero emission bus transition, what we've worked with the industry insiders to try and understand how we might work with the government to accelerate that transition. And one of the key parts of that is to look at the, the network of buses that we, we operate. Because if we, considering the, 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 the bus transition, the, the low emission bus transmission. We're pretty clear from our work that the government could commit to a faster timetable and make some calls on the te technical specifications uh, rather than engaging in series of trials. I think there's enough international experience that we can move forward fast. The, the second point I'd like to make is that we can't do that transition effectively under the current contracting models. The, the, the way of small company particularly uh, contracts with the government to operate diesel buses is just not appropriate to the complexities of of, um, of the of running electric buses so the the changeover of contracts in 25 the expiry of many of the smaller contracts in mid 25 is a really important point to with new new approaches but um oops. The, the other part of this, and what I want to talk to you most about this evening, is the, uh, the, re, the need to form how we run our buses. If we were successful in making the transition to electric buses, but we considered continue to run the buses in the same pattern that we have today, then we really wouldn't be going as far or as fast as we need to in and dealing with the, the climate crisis. We need to be getting people out of their cars. And the only way we can do that is to, to change the way we do, we operate buses so that, um, so that people uh, do have the option to, to leave their car at home. And we focused in the, in the West, particularly because that's where a lot of the um, social inequalities and spatial inequalities are, are most marked, but it's also where, and I'll talk in the, as we go along, that we're really aware, as Peter said earlier, there's a state election coming up. It's in the West where we think that there is um, some really important opportunities for, for putting the uh, 
the case to, to government for, for, for improvements. The case for improvements is really clearly outlined when you look at the existing route structures. There's 80 different routes running in the, the Western suburbs and um, many of them operate at very low frequencies. They don't run on Sundays. They don't connect well with trains. They don't connect with other, other services. So people who use those services and they're you know, people do use them, but they're largely the people who, for whatever reason, and for all of us at some time in our life, will be in this position of not being able to drive. So it's older people. Uh, and these, these bus services do work for those people eventually, but for anybody who has a choice, this system um, really doesn't, doesn't cut it. Spending quite a lot of money in, in running those bus services, but we really need to think about how we might reorganize those. And how starkly you can see how the, the problem, this is the SNAMATS index, which um, colleagues, um, Jan Schorer and Kerry Curtis um, have put together internationally to try and compare how a public transport system offers people access across the suburban area. And if you don't have services at a minimum level of even you know, 30 minutes during the day or um, more frequently in peak hour. But if you don't have any service at level, then you really don't get people to first base. And so for most of the, the West, we don't have a service that, that operates at any sort of standard as to, to be able to deliver good accessibility. And even along the, the railways where we, we do have you know, the more service, it's really hard to get to those railways and, and anybody from the West will attest the problems of parking and the, the problems of getting on a train, even if you can you can get to the station. So we need something else to, to help people move around the, the, um, the, around the suburbs. So what we're proposing, and to just to, uh, before I get to this proposal, this is by no means a fully fleshed out idea it's this is something to hopefully raise uh, discussion and um, hopefully we can follow this up with with individuals here tonight about how we actually use this to engage with the dot and with the government to think about how they might expand the work that they've already put in place in the, the bus reform plan so we know that the government is on the move to make changes to, to buses, but what we're trying to do is open up the, the, the discussion to, to the maximum extent. So we, we're not at all replacing the work of the, um, the, the DOT. We're just trying to conceptually show how we could make, it, make a difference. So our idea is to take the existing service kilometers that we, we have and put them onto the Western suburbs in a really different pattern. Basically a grid pattern where, and we use the, the Remix software, which is the software that um, transport planners within the DOT use. And it allows you to put the parameters of your of, of a new network into, the, into a, uh, a model, and it'll tell you how many bus services you need, how many bus service hours you need to run a particular frequency or a particular uh, running at a particular speed. So we put these these routes into the map and you'll you, anybody who knows the West will see that we've got routes which cross railway lines and cross waterways at points where um, currently you can't do that. So this is really a, something to, to look forward to into, into future when perhaps you would you would have the resources to um, to expand the, the potential for, for buses to cross railway lines and, and, and creeks into bus and active transport only only bridges but if you did that what we and you 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 used um, basically the, the the techniques that we know exist to work in bus rapid transit to give buses priority on the, the roads and so you could get better than current smart bus average speeds. What we were really surprised to find is that you could run this 10 minute service all day every day 
for the same number of service hours that we exist currently use to run the network that very few use. So while this was this is a, a conceptual idea that would take some years to to bring to fruition, what it shows is that it's the capital rather than the operating costs that that are that are um, that are the, ba the barrier perhaps. And capital is often easier to, to, to generate than, than operating money. So our network um, just broadly covers the Western suburbs at a walking distance of 800 metres instead of 400 metres. And we've chosen the 800 metre catchment for a number of reasons. One, it makes this, this network viable, but it also represents a distance that people have said in surveys in Melbourne and the experience internationally, that if you give people a high frequency service, then that sort of distances. And you can see there's some gaps in the coverage. And so you know, this is, this is a, a conceptual idea that would need fleshing out and perhaps Know, some deviations to, to, to meet those services. But it also, it, what it points to is the difference between a, a service parameters, a service criteria of 800 metres from every household compared to 400 metres. Because the, the DOT standard of 400 metres is, is really not very useful because it's 400 metres from a bus stop not 400 metres from a bus stop that actually takes you somewhere on a weekend or takes you somewhere on an evening or gets you quickly to the station on a, on a weekday morning. So we've said, let's define our service parameters much more in terms of what's possible and then um, build a, a catchment ar around those. So that 400 metres from a bus stop is part of the reason why we have such a circuitous set of, of, of bus routes in, in Melbourne today. So we we're hoping we would transform the, the, the way we think about the, um, the network to, to think about the service standards being the quality and the access that, it, that, that that quality gives you. The other thing that we did with the model, because the model actually incorporates a connection to ABS data. So you can actually look at how many people have access within a certain amount of time. And what we did was compare our conceptual model with existing um, access. And what we found was that the numbers of people able to reach key activity centres right across the West from Brimbank and St Albans right down to towards Hoppers Crossing and Werribee and across towards Footscray. Right across that, that, the Western suburbs, there's improvements in access to the activity centres. And down in, in Wyndham, it uh, improves dramatically. For, for Hoppers Crossing, it's 10 times more people are able to reach an activity centre within 30 minutes. So being able to conceptualise your route your system in terms of what it offers people is really important. And I think that's that's what we've, we're trying to demonstrate here, that, it, that if you do start thinking about frequency, speed and connection, then you do, you are able to offer people uh, a, a vastly better service and that's, then they can start to think about what, what could they do with that sort of access? Maybe their kids could get to a part-time job on the weekend without having to be driven there. They get This could replace the school bus system. This could um, give people access to different jobs. And we're actually basing this on, on work that's already been done in many cities. And Auckland is, is one city where, where this, this model of um, frequency and connection is being put to, to good use. And you can follow this up and um, many people already will have seen this, this, this video and see that quote, frequency is freedom and understand the, the connection to people like Jarrett Walker who uh, have been promoting these ideas for, for many years. So what Auckland have done is really with a small increase in their expenditure on bus operations have vastly increased the, the number of places that people can get to and it's it's working they're getting five times the 
growth in public transport use in bus use compared to um, population growth. So modal shift is happening in, even in the, the first years of, of this, um, this change. So what we're suggesting is it's time for the, the Victorian Parliament to translate its care for about climate, its care for communities, and the sort of care that was shown during the, the pandemic to um, deliver something that if within the next term of government, whoever's in government action could make a fundamental difference to the way in the suburbs by starting to, to, to move to this sort of um, fast, frequent and connected network. And if it's operated but given the, the, the sort of work that the MTF does, I think I, what I wanted to, to finish with is really to, to, to remind people of how policy change happens and how important it is for the work of and people in, in local government in Melbourne to, to take up this, um, the, the challenge of, of improving the, the bus networks. This is work that, um, I came across actually doing my PhD, which back 20 years ago, when that was funded, it was part, partly funded through the MTF. So I owe a real debt of gratitude to the organisation for putting me on the, the path to my academic career. But one of the things that we've seen is that it's really important that people ask for, for these sort of changes and that they demonstrate that popular support in um, in many ways as, that they can. And I know that um, um, the MTF has been an important player in, in giving people avenues to, to support changes to, to, to transport policy. And that transport, that support needs to turn into a political mandate and clear commitments. And I've got some examples of the sort of commitments we think that, that can be made in a moment. And the political action, both for, you know, at local government level and at, um, at state level, is really important over the long term so that the people, the, the transport planners who actually make these, have a chance to embed their what new ways of doing things. And if you take the Auckland example, it took 10 or more years since the idea of changes was seated and polit politicians took them up and uh, transport planners put them into practice. The, there was a really important role in political leaders keeping that space open and building more and more support. Because we know that there's a danger with when you change a bus route, and I'm sure many of you all have experienced this, you change the bus route, the people who use it right to the minister, the people who might use it are not motivated yet to, to, to take up any sort of action. And so that you would get a, um, a strong focus on the negative and not a focus on the positive. If we are going to make these changes, we are going to have to give many, many more people the opportunity to say, this is what, what they would like to see. That the sort of commitments that we would be looking for from the major parties and from key independents is that we think that if you put in around about, for the Western suburbs, around about 30 million a year, in addition to the, um, the money that you're currently spending on operations and a capital investment for new bus stops, simple uh, traffic, priority measures, then within a year or so, you could actually start to put a, the first stage of a fast, frequent and connected network in place. And if you're doing that alongside accelerating your um, transition to electric buses, you've got a whole new product to, to offer people. And you've got to say, say, I know you might've had bad experiences with buses in the past, but here's a clean, quiet vehicle operating in a really different manner to, to, to the way we previously set buses up. So come and have a look at this new, new offer. And then I think once you've got that up and running, then you can start to build the support for the longer term stage, which, which requires, as I said earlier, the, the sort of um, 
some capital works to to basically future proof the buses so that growth in car use doesn't stop you having the, the fast and, and, and frequent network. So those sort of things are, are things which you know, um, we put out there in our in our report um, as possible ways that people could could take up the advocacy, but I think in different parts of Melbourne we might uh, take that. So I'm really happy to to work with with lo different local governments to see how people might articulate this um, leading up to the, the state election. But as I said earlier, we really need the, the public as part of this debate. So I've been working closely with um, with community organisations, um, with Friends of the Earth, whose Better Bus campaign um, is is really promoting these ideas, and they have um, recently got a, a significant grant from the Lord Mayor's Fund to be out and about during the uh, the lead up to the election and working with local communities to to um, build the public support. So it's not just coming from from people like me who might be seen to you know be banging on this on about this stuff for a long time but it's it's new people coming new voices coming into the debate so yeah just to leave the dam perhaps um very happy to ask the questions and certainly very happy to to work with people to to figure out how we can all work together to to put these sort of ideas on the, firmly on the agenda for the uh, for the election because the state government has already said in its um in its bus reform plans that it's moving in these directions. It's what they need is the confidence that there'll be public support for them going further and faster. So thanks. Thank you, John. And thank you for that generous offer, which we'll follow up at the end as well.